The level of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere is expressed as the CO2 concentration measured in parts per million. NASA has reproduced the record of CO2 concentration over the last 400,000 years. Over this period, the concentration varies mainly due to the natural cycles of ice ages, but over the last 650,000 years it has never exceeded 300 parts per million. Until very recently, where since the Industrial Revolution you see it jumping up to 396 ppm in 2012, almost vertically at this scale. This is what we call humanity's contribution to the CO2 concentration. Some people question how it is possible that us humans can make such an impact while nature's in and out flows, vegetation absorbing CO2, oceans releasing CO2, are so much larger. In fact, you have to imagine the atmosphere as a bathtub. Before the Industrial Revolution, what was flowing into the top was flowing out and kept the level in the top the same. But, as you can imagine, if you add an additional flow, caused by human activity, as small as it might be, the level will slowly rise and eventually the top will overflow. So why is it important to measure the CO2 concentration? Because it traps the heat from the sun and it helps to warm the atmosphere, what we call the greenhouse effect. As you can see from this graph, the global CO2 concentration is strongly correlated to the average temperature on Earth. In fact, humanity was able to thrive because of a stable temperature for the last 10,000 years. But over the last decades, the temperature has started to rise rapidly, following the CO2 concentration. From pre-industrial levels to today's levels, and we are facing a dangerous situation in the near future. Because scientists agree that once we reach past 450 ppm CO2 concentration, which is equal to a temperature rise of about 2 degrees Celsius, things will get really bad. We are already seeing the effects of this around us. Sea level rise due to melting polar caps, more droughts through prolonged periods without rain, but also more and more intense floods due to heavy rainfall, a significant and permanent loss of biodiversity on land and at sea. Ocean acidification caused by increased absorption of CO2, destroying marine life and coral reefs. Desertification of previously productive land. Increases of diseases carried by insects that thrive in warmer climates. Mass famine due to loss of harvest. Increased migration and conflict because productive land becomes more scarce. And yes, there will be more extreme colds as well. More wildfires caused by the drought. And generally, more frequent and more intense storms creating havoc and destruction. Basically, once we reach 450 ppm, or 2 degrees temperature rise, our global climate will spiral out of control, sending billions of people back to poverty and making sustaining our human society as we know it virtually impossible. So let's have a closer look to what determines this human contribution to the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. It equals to P, the number of people alive in the world, times S, the services required per individual, times E, the energy required per service, times C, the carbon emitted per unit of energy. So, considering humanity's contribution in 2012, what can we expect for it in 2030? What are the trends? Well, for P, we can assume that the population will rise from today's 7 billion to 8.3 billion in 2030. That's a 19% increase. For S, the services per individual, we see that a 4% increase of global GDP is forecast. Most of this growth is coming from the developing world. This means that compared to 2012, the average GDP per individual will rise by 71% in 2030. E, the energy intensity of the services, is continuously decreased by increases in energy efficiency. 
We have been making good efforts in this in the past and we can expect to do so in the future. Research shows that it's very difficult to maintain an average global decrease in energy intensity across all sectors higher than 1 to 1.2% per year. So for 2030 we can expect an overall reduction of about 18%. And then finally C, the carbon intensity of our energy. This has been quite a stable variable and on average only decreased by 0.3% per year since 1960. Despite increased use of renewable energy, recent investments in coal plants have in fact caused a temporary increase in the global carbon intensity. For a business as usual scenario, it's therefore safe to assume a sustained reduction of 0.3% per year, which means 4.6% by 2030 compared to now. This means that in 2030 we can expect a 19% larger population to use 71% more services that require 18% less energy which will emit 5% less carbon and that our total human emissions will rise by 57% compared to 2012. This is what that looks like in a graph. Starting with the historical measurements of the CO2 concentration since 1960 leading up to the 396 ppm in 2012. This is the current path towards a 50% increase in 2030. Which means that before 2030 we will have crossed that danger limit of 450 ppm and we will face a global catastrophe. Now to avoid this we need to plan for a trajectory that levels off below 450 ppm and brings us back to a level which is generally considered safe, 350 ppm. Bear in mind that the dotted line still shows a very risky scenario. Because just imagine that this red line represents the edge of a deep and dangerous ravine and that this black dotted road runs right along the edge. And then imagine you are driving on this road. How close do you want to drive along the edge? And how close to the edge do you want to be if you know that you have your children and your grandchildren in the back seat? So, what should we do to achieve this path to safety? Let's have another look at the equation. P, the population, is very difficult to influence. Especially we consider the time period we have of 18 years. Population forecasts for 2030 are pretty consistent and there will be very little we can do to make any significant changes. Then S, the services, which are determined by the GDP per capita. As pointed out, most of the increase will be caused by countries like India and China. McKinsey expects that 3 billion new middle-class consumers will be added to the 1.7 billion we have today. It will be virtually impossible to tell those people that they are not allowed to get that desirable middle class. E, the energy intensity is how much energy we need to produce a dollar of GDP. We have made good progress on this in the past, but it will become increasingly difficult to maintain as we get closer to the physical limits of how energy efficient a power plant can be. Research says that for example an energy intensity decline of 2% per year until 2030 would require the global power generation sector to become 28% more efficient. So we should try our best to reduce this as much as we can, but don't expect any miracles here. And then C, the carbon emissions per unit of energy. Finally some good news. Replacing fossil fuel power plants by renewable energy is a very feasible solution to drastically reduce our carbon emissions within a short period of time. So in summary, we need to maximize our efforts on energy efficiency and above all, we need to massively replace fossil fuels by renewable energy. To demonstrate the magnitude of this challenge, look at this graph depicting the world's carbon intensity since 1975. It's pretty flat. And look at the growing economies India and China. They are going in the wrong direction due to their craving for cheap energy. It becomes clear that lowering our carbon intensity by the necessary 15 to 20 percent in the next 18 years is going to be a major challenge. So I hear you thinking what can I do about this? 
Well, we have seen that the current trends show that if we continue what we are doing, our planet will face a global catastrophe before 2030. So that is in less than 18 years from now. What that means is that changing your light bulbs, recycling your trash, etc. is not enough to save the planet. It is not enough to save yourself or to save the future generations. It is clear that today's political leaders are still refusing to accept these facts and really internalize what they mean. They are delaying the radical action we need. Those of you who believe that a free market can solve this, once we really get close to the critical point, please consider it would only be possible once governments have put the regulations into place that make the market account for the cost of the externalities, i.e. the common resources that are currently not priced in our economy, such as carbon emissions, pollution, deforestation and loss of biodiversity. So we need to put a realistic price on these externalities, starting with a realistic price on carbon. And we need to stop investing in technologies that are moving us in the opposite direction. No more coal-fired power plants. No more tar sands. No more shale gas. So the most important thing that you can do is making this the single most important criterion when you vote. Don't think that boosting our economy is more important now. Our future economy depends on this. Don't do it to save the environment. Do it to save yourself and for the future of your children. Let's start thinking beyond 2030 today.